polio, the swift crippler. In the early 1900s, it swept across Europe and then the US. At first, victims would feel only cold-like symptoms. Then suddenly, stiffness and painful contractions. Soon, the limbs would weaken, then go lifeless. Lives shattered, hopes lost. Physicians were overwhelmed with the number of cases needing treatment. In situations where paralyzed patients were able to recover, it was only after intense physical rehabilitation. Sadly, treatment of this type was difficult for physicians to provide. A new style of medical therapy was needed. To meet the crisis, physicians borrowed an idea that it started in Europe. They recruited physical education teachers who had been working in schools correcting scoliosis, poor posture, and flat feet. These teachers had backgrounds in anatomy, kinesiology, exercise, physiology, and psychology, and they were perfectly suited for the rigorous rehabilitation programs polio victims needed. Treatments soon began, and the new physiotherapists quickly gained medical recognition, bringing relief and hope to thousands of stricken patients. Out of crisis and need, what would one day become the profession of physical therapy had been born. During this time, in rural Texas, one young woman was following a course that would soon draw her into this new profession. Ruby Decker, daughter of a rice farmer, oldest of seven children. She had grace, exuberance, and an amazing talent for making the most of every situation. Some called it luck. Well, Ruby Decker was just rolling with the punches. Uh, you just went to school, and you studied, and you got good grades, and uh, we were interested in uh, learning how to read and read and write. When I got to high school, I uh, played basketball. I did become interested in that because I was tall, so I made a good jumping center. And I played, I, I played uh, uh, basketball in high school, which had an effect upon what I decided to do after I graduated from high school which was go to a school of physical education. When I graduated from high school, the very the next thing I did was go to a school of physical education in Battle Creek, Michigan, which was a private school uh, run by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, who had a large spa. Now, spas were vacation centers. They had them in Europe, they'd, and they were having them here in the United States. And he had accommodations to house a thousand people in the summertime. That's where you went for your vacation. You didn't fly to Europe and all of those kind of things like they do now. And uh, he wanted, uh, uh, he had two private schools. One was dietetics and the other was physical education. We had to take uh, massage and hydrotherapy. This advanced course of study was destined to play a pivotal role in Ruby Decker's upcoming career. While Ruby and the rest of America basked in the glory of a prosperous new century, in Europe, ominous events began to shape the future. World War I a war larger and more devastating than any that had come before. At first thousands, and then hundreds of thousands of men were killed and maimed between the trenches that stretched hundreds of miles across Europe. No man's land. In 1917, the U.S. entered the war, and soon a flood of wounded soldiers began to return to the U.S. from Europe. The need was clear, and physicians again turned to the concept of physical therapy to meet the crisis. The U.S. Surgeon General's Office established the Women's Auxiliary Medical Aids Department as part of the Reconstruction Division. Physiotherapist Marguerite Sanderson was appointed Supervisor of Reconstruction Aids. Her responsibilities were to recruit physiotherapists and organize the service to quickly provide the physical therapy desperately needed by thousands of wounded soldiers. Sanderson was no stodgy paper pusher. She personally went overseas with the first unit of reconstruction aids. Back in the US, another pioneer in physical therapy, Mary McMillan, became the first physiotherapist assigned to a US Army hospital. She had treated British soldiers in Europe during the early years of the war, and now she charged ahead. 
organizing the physiotherapy department at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., and later training physiotherapy recruits. Through the efforts of Macmillan, Sanderson, and others, the profession of physical therapy was growing quickly. Even as the war ended, recruiting programs continued to attract talented young physical education majors. One of them, recently graduated from Battle Creek College, was now a physical education instructor in Port Arthur, Texas, Ruby Decker. Nineteen eighteen was the first year we had the severe Spanish influenza epidemics in this in the United States. I had it early. They closed in Port Arthur, and they closed the schools. And then they uh, St. Mary's Hospital asked that those people that had had the flu, they asked them would they volunteer to nurse those that were having the flu. So I volunteered. I had a family of six, and every one of them were flat on their backs in bed with flu. Our main instructions was to see that they got their meals and their medication, and to notify St. Mary's Hospital if there were any untoward events that happened. I was on night duty. So after several cups of strong black coffee and 12 o'clock at night and my patients were all asleep, I was reading the paper. And I read where the Surgeon General of the United States Army was looking for reconstruction aids in physiotherapy to treat uh, the patients, the soldiers. And I read on, and as I did, my eyes got bigger and I got more excited when I found out that I had the qualifications. The requirements were that we have, that the, they, the reconstruction aides have knowledge of massage and one of either hydrotherapy or electrotherapy. Of all the schools in the United States I could have gone to, I picked the only one in the United States that it had that in their course. So I wrote to the Surgeon General, now oh, I knew nothing about going uh, steps, you know, right straight to the Surgeon General, gave my qualifications. The letter was brief, respectful, and in true Ruby Decker fashion. Tactfully mentioned that the president of her alma mater sat on the reconstruction board. Three weeks later, Ruby received a reply from Washington containing an application and instructions. One of my instructions was, uh, one of them was to get a uh, physical examination from the draft board in Port Arthur, which I did, and to report to Dr. Hatch and Miss Sue Price, who was his uh, physiotherapist in uh, New Orleans. So I went down during the Christmas holidays, and Dr. Hatch just asked me a few questions and then sent me in to Miss Sue Price for her to check me and see if I was qualified. And uh, so she asked me many, many questions. And soon she stuck out her arm and says, show me the different movements of massage. Well, a parachutist on his first jump couldn't have been more apprehensive than I was, but I proceeded to give them the different movements of massage and massaged her arm. When I finished, she says, uh, have you ever had any experience with stumps and old fractures? And I said, no. She says, well, you seem intelligent and tell the truth. I will, I will approve your application. That's all it took for me to be a physical therapist. The war had ended a few weeks earlier, but Ruby went home determined to serve if her country called. At the end of January, a letter arrived from the War Department. Enclosed was Ruby's appointment as a reconstruction aide and directions that she report for duty to Camp Sherman in Chillicothe, Ohio. Her salary was to be a whopping $50 per month plus room, board, and laundry, a considerable raise from her pay as a physical education teacher. Out of the windfall, Ruby purchased her uniform from the Red Cross. She packed her bags and took the train to Ohio. Well, when I got to Chillicothe, Ohio, I was absolutely overwhelmed with the number of patients we had and their conditions. 
their deformities, their, their wounds. They had uh, ward after ward of patients with infections that uh, were, at, uh, at that time, there were no antibiotics, no sulfur, no penicillin. And these patients were uh, located, uh, were uh, placed in beds with rubber sheets on them, frames over the bed with uh, Dakin's solution in bottles that irrigate for irrigation of their wounds. Everywhere the young physiotherapist looked, there were patients needing attention. What Ruby had learned in books and classes now had to be put into practice. At that time, we had uh, one day of uh, orientation. It didn't take us a week then, just one day. And the next day, I was given a patient. Now, my first patient diagnosis was ankylosis of the wrist. And I was, uh, uh, the prescription was a hot arm bath, massage, and exercise. I saw, I could see that the man had a stiff wrist. And I wondered how the ankle got into the act. And I put him in the hot arm bath and went into the office and got a medical dictionary and looked up the word ankylosis, which I found out meant stiffness or lack of motion in a joint. And there, right there, I declared that I would never ask a question about something I didn't know until I had tried to look it up first. Because if you do that too often, people don't think you're very bright. That was one of the smartest things I ever did. The actual anatomical location of that first stiff wrist also caused some question. Look down at the, at the bottom, it says, where wounded, in this prescription I got, where wounded. And guess what it says? Verdun front. That's the battle in which he was wounded. I thought it was an uh, obscure anatomical position in the body somewhere. To help answer some of these questions of ankles and wrists, all the new physiotherapists went through extensive in-service training. This included lectures and clinical demonstrations, which prompted some reconstruction aides to sing this tune. In this amphitheater drear, we turn hot and cold with fear. Nurse, bring in that swollen knee. Now, young women, what do you see? Sign of itis, by gosh. I spent, I spent all my spare time reading the instructions that were given for each uh, different machine. We had, uh, we, in, at Camp Sherman, they had an old static electricity machine, which they were not using. They had quit using it. That used to be all the goal. You gave this patient electricity the way you put on the electrodes, and it was static electricity, and he's, that was when men had short hair, and the hair would stand straight up. And, uh, but we didn't use it. And so, but we had all of the, quotes current electrical machines. And I spent all my spare time reading those because I, I had, that was, that was my first exposure to them. That was part of my learning experience. After five months at Camp Sherman, Ruby was transferred to Fort Sam Houston near San Antonio in Texas. There, she met another pioneer in physical therapy, Mary Callahan. And the rest of the physical therapists there would speak with awed tone and say, she's the smartest physical therapist on the post. And I said, why is she so smart? They said, well, she knows the nerve supply to every muscle in the body. And I thought, well, if that's all it takes to be a smart physical therapist, I will learn the nerve supply to every muscle. And I did, and I still know. It really is one of the things that will just absolutely wow a doctor in nothing flat, if you know that. He just thinks, if you know, well, he just gets the idea you're real smart. If you know that, you know everything else. 
12 weeks after arriving in Texas, Ruby was again transferred, this time to Fort McPherson at Atlanta, Georgia. While we were there, General Pershing visited us. And they had all the women on the post line up uh, along the uh, driveway. And this included nurses, physical therapists, OTs, secretaries, uh, laboratory technicians, everybody lined up in their uniform to greet General Pershing. Now, we had a, 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 a regular army sergeant was pacing up and down and muttering under his breath, uh, muttering, every damn one of them has to learn to salute. Well, we had never learned to salute before. So when he told us to raise our arm up to our forehead, we did, and some of them raised it like this, and some of them raised it like this, and the left-handed ones did it like this, and like this, and he would say, no! And uh, that then, it was after that that he said that we, we had to learn to salute, so he had to give us more instructions. All of a sudden, here comes General Pershing to the gate. So as this sergeant left the, um, um, the driveway, he says, well, at least try to stand still. By the time of Pershing's visit, the war had been over for a year. The Army's need for physiotherapists was winding down. After an exciting year of challenge and travel, in April of 1920, Ruby Decker was released from the service. At the time, job opportunities in the new field of physiotherapy were still scarce. So, during a visit with a friend in Los Angeles, when Ruby was offered a job in an auto supply store in the billing department, she accepted. It seemed a sensible career move. Well, nine months of that was all I could take. Talk about being bored, a boresome job. The only people you saw were people that were working with you there. And having been a, a reconstruction aide with lots of people, you can imagine, uh, as I say, I was just bored stiff, so I came home. Then I tried uh, selling books. That lasted one week. One more letter to the Surgeon General brought this reply. Ruby Decker had again been accepted as a physiotherapist in the Army. She was assigned to work at Camp Logan in Houston, Texas. That year, 1921, was a watershed for Ruby and also for the profession of physical therapy. The organization that would one day become the American Physical Therapy Association was chartered and Mary McMillan was elected president. With a membership composed primarily of reconstruction aides, this organization soon was establishing educational standards, setting up opportunities for advanced study, and sponsoring various licensing legislation throughout the country. From an obscure specialty, physical therapy was on its way to becoming mainstream medical treatment. By 1924, physical therapy had become popular enough for orthopedists to regularly employ PTs in their practice. That year, Ruby Decker went to work for just such an orthopedist in Shreveport, Louisiana. His name was Guy A. Caldwell. And in addition to physical therapy, he had Ruby taking x-rays, photographing patients before and after surgery, and even making plaster casts. At that, at that time, you couldn't buy your plaster, uh, the, the uh, bandages to make plaster casts. You couldn't buy them already made. You had to buy the crinoline Tear, tear it with the width that you wanted. You see, if you want to fix a hand or something, you have a narrow width, and if you want to make a back uh, cast, you have a wider one. So we had two or three different widths, and we had to ravel them so that this, uh, this uh, string wouldn't get hooked up when they were making the plaster, so we had to ravel them about three threads on each side, and uh, then put them in the plaster and push them with a uh, we had a, a, if I remember correctly, we had a uh, sort of a, a little round board and push it to push the plaster into the plaster cast and then roll it up. Then when you got ready to put it on the patient, you put it in water and let it stay so long. 
and squeezed it and gave it to the doctor and he made the plaster cast. I learned to do that. Ruby had settled into a comfortable life, but soon a series of setbacks would change everything. I was diagnosed having tuberculosis. And uh, the doctor put me, he had a sanitarium there in Shreveport and he put me in this sanitarium. And uh, I stayed there six months, chasing the cure. And uh, then was discharged. Now I learned to play chess and all the old lungers said that when they got out they were gonna get a chicken farm so they could breathe fresh air while they were working. So that sounded like a good idea to me. So I decided I'd do the same thing. Well, Pop loaned me some money and I ordered 2,000 baby chicks. I didn't even have a house to put them in. But by the time they were hatched and ready to deliver, I had the house and I had the, the uh, uh, places to, uh, you know, to keep them warm and so forth. And uh, I wound up with a chicken farm. And uh, I had, I sold about 350 fryers a week and had 2,000 hens. And I was just doing fine. But fate would change Ruby's plans a second time. The depression hit. And to support the chicken farm, Ruby was forced to go back to work. First at the charity hospital in Shreveport, and then back with Dr. Caldwell. As the depression deepened, the third and worst shock came. I thought I was going to work there the rest of my life. And he called me in one day. He had a, a sister who was married to a young man, and he had lost his job, so Dr. Caldwell was supporting the sister. And then I was working for him as the physical therapist. So he decided that he would send Helen, her name was Helen, to uh, uh, John Hopkins Hospital for a four months course in physical therapy. And then he would hire her to be his physical therapist. So he called me in and told me this. Well, if, as I say, that, that's the only time I remember ever just being panicked. The floor literally fell out from under my feet. I was so upset. But he says to me, now Ruby, you don't have to quit until you get another job. At that time, there were, there were 13 orthopedists in the whole state of Texas. I wanted to get, see, I was, uh, 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 I wanted to get close to where the family were because my mother and father were getting older. So I wanted to get a job in Texas. I got one in Texas. Guess where? In March of 1935, Ruby went to work for the City County Hospital in El Paso, the most distant city in the state of Texas. For Ruby, this must have seemed the latest and most painful chapter in the series of misfortune. The Decker luck, though, hadn't really deserted her. In its roundabout way, it was quickly moving her to the leading edge of her profession. The orthopedist in charge at the City County Hospital, Dr. Frank Goodwin, was quickly impressed with the straight-talking, no-nonsense PT from Texas. She seemed to know the nerve supply to every muscle in the human body. And in a muscle test, which she recreates here, she demonstrated her familiarity with the body's muscle structure. Line on your back. <laughs> okay, now straighten your leg. Straighten it. See, I'm pushing. Yeah. So Dr. Goodwin, did that. See, he's lying on his back on the table, and he looked at me and he says, I thought you said the quadriceps was zero. I didn't say a word. I said to the little boy, now you sit up and hang your feet over the edge of the table. So he did. I said, straighten your knee, and he couldn't budge it. When you change the resistance, you change the muscle that they use, he straightened his, now you see you have your hip flexed. And when he pushed, push hard, he straightened it with the extensor of his hip. And because you were forcing here, and he's lying on his back, that makes him straighten the knee. Dr. Goodwin never questioned another muscle test I ever did for the rest of the eight years we worked together. 
In 1937, Dr. Goodwin left the City County Hospital to become Chief Surgeon at Cary Tingley Hospital for Crippled Children, a new state-of-the-art facility in New Mexico. Ruby Decker was his immediate choice as Chief Physical Therapist. Now that was at the time when it was all the goal to treat patients with polio in the under, underwater treatment, warm water. Well, they had natural hot springs at hot springs. So that's why the, the people in New Mexico decided to build it there. This is when the March of Dimes, the March of Dimes, the polio foundations, supported these things. And of course, everybody wanted to get one. When I got the job at New Mexico, New Mexico, they suggested that they hadn't finished building the building yet, don't you know? And they suggested that I go and spend at least six weeks at Warm Springs, Georgia, where they had started this underwater treatment, you see. And Alice Lou Plastridge was the physical therapist in charge of Warm Springs, Georgia. And she had been the physical therapist that treated President Roosevelt when he had polio. And he suggested that they put her on that job. So I go down there. Now in the olden days, the hospital didn't pay for you for extra uh, education. They'd say, tell you that this is what you needed and you paid for it yourself, see. So I, my folks, my father always backed me up when I was gonna go on these wild things, uh, ideas. And so he uh, loaned me the money, but I paid him back and um, I, st I went down there and stayed the six weeks. Well, this was when I really got into the very latest method of treating polio patients. And then I used that when I came up to uh, Cary Tingley. In a few short years, Ruby had gone from chicken farmer to chief physical therapist at a prestigious facility. In the years following, she would do some of her best clinical work and also face some of her biggest professional challenges. Nineteen forty two. The world was again at war. Emma Vogel, a veteran physiotherapist from World War I, was now in charge of the physical therapy division, which was now a department of the Army. Ruby was 45 years old, but ready to re-enlist. So I wrote to Amy Lou and told her that I wanted to be in the Army, <clears throat> and uh, so on and so forth, and made my application. And she wrote back and told me that I couldn't join the Army because I had never graduated from a school of physical therapy. Well, I wrote, <clears throat> I wrote Amy Lou a letter, a three-page letter, which I never did receive an answer for. But I proceeded to tell her that my background was the same as hers. And the only difference was that I hadn't stayed in the Army, and she had, and she was now a colonel. I just gave her down the road. I was so disgusted I couldn't see straight. She told me I could be a physical therapy assistant. Now here I'd been in charge of all of these things and asked me to be a physical therapy assistant. So I did not go into the Army. But Dr. Goodwin and the rest of the medical staff did. So that left Terry Tingley Hospital up there with the chief nurse and me. We got permission from Washington to keep the hospital open for non-operative deformed and, and uh, uh, children. So the chief nurse and I made ward rounds every day. And I corrected the club feet. I had learned how to correct club feet by helping the doctors, you know, with the plasters. So I did the uh, correction for club feet and had permission to do that. So I practiced medicine for a while. It was during this time that Ruby's good luck would again take hold. We had lots of visitors out at Cary Tingley. And one of them that came through was named Billy Louise Crook. She was working in San Marcos, Texas at that time. But later she went on to work down at Galveston. And uh, they started the school. The School of Physical Therapy was opened at the medical branch at Galveston in 1943. It was the first one in the state of Texas, the first school. Billy and Ruby stayed in touch. And in 1945, when Billy left UTMB to follow her husband to Austin, she recommended as her replacement Ruby Decker. The president of UTMB, Chauncey Leake, concurred. And in February of 1945, Ruby arrived to begin her directorship. 
at that time, the American Medical Association was approving the uh, schools of physical therapy. And Dr. Lee, well, after I got there, see, he wrote to them and told them that I had uh, applied and that, uh, you know, they had to, and he was writing to them for approval. Well, he called me back in uh, a short time and told me, said, my Miss Decker, it looks to me like we're going to have a little trouble. I had a letter from the AMA just recently, and they said they didn't see how they could approve you to be the director of a school of physical therapy when you had never graduated from a school of physical therapy. It seemed the very issue that had kept Ruby out of World War II would now keep her out of Texas. Unless, of course, she was lucky. Guess who was on the Council of Medical Education and Hospitals? Dr. Caldwell. So I wrote to Guy and told him it'd be about as silly for me to go to a school of physical therapy after 21 years of experience as it would be for him to go back and take two more years residency in orthopedics because they just needed one when he got in. And anyway, Dr. Lee called me in shortly afterwards and said, well, Miss Decker, I don't know what your friend told him, but the AMA said you were all right. So I stayed there 18 and a half years. Optimism, luck, cleverness. However it's described, it was attitude that had brought Ruby to where she was. Attitude had made her a success. Now she tried to pass that same philosophy on to her students. 75% of patient care is psychological even though we don't know it. It's getting the patient to accept what he has and make the most of it. It was also attitude that solved Ruby's one remaining problem. I've always had a philosophy in my lifetime, which has worked out fine. I uh, don't buck the system. I just beat them to the draw. So I decided I would graduate from my school of physical therapy. So I did. Ruby's transcript reflected one of the highest grade point averages ever in UTMB history. In 1962, at the age of 65, Ruby Decker left UTMB for what would mistakenly be called retirement. found at the venerable age of 70 years that her greatest challenge still lay ahead. One day she was teaching a class at Duke when a call came for her from Washington, D.C. And when I excused myself from the class at Duke, I said, uh, uh, I've been called to the phone. I've been called to the phone, Washington, D.C. Excuse me, please. So I walked out and came back and I told him I was going to Pakistan. And I went to Lahore, West Pakistan and started the School of Physiotherapy. Ruby arrived in Lahore, West Pakistan, to find a world very different from the one she knew. Sexes were strictly segregated. Women were veiled. To protect her and her students from serious culture shock, Ruby wisely turned student discipline over to a Pakistani administrator. Soon after, one of her students was disciplined. We had been there just about six weeks when he fired, you know, one of the boys that was in school. So uh, I had left it up to him, disciplinary things. So um, they, uh, uh, several weeks later, I said, now I've been around for a long time. I want to know why you fired this young man. He reached down his desk and pulled out a piece of paper. He says he wrote this note to one of the girls. And uh, I, I read it. Dear uh, Qureshi, do not put your hand to your face. It makes my heart throb. Excuse me, please. That was an insult. I didn't dare tell him that if any American girl got a note like that, she'd be flattered, because I didn't know what he'd think about American women. Every day brought new challenges to teach physical therapy while still observing Pakistani customs. Typical of this was Ruby's first massage class with women. So then I said, well, now we're ready for practice. Now take off your blouse. My dear, just absolutely it, a dead wall. Nobody budged and nobody did anything. I says, I told you to take off your blouse. 
And they said, well, Miss Decker, we're not going to do it. This was against their rules, even with just women. Well, I'd been taught that you didn't give massage over clothes. I learned you do. And it really doesn't make any difference. What difference does it make whether you do this over a sleeve, see what I mean, or do the same thing next to the skin? So my dear, uh, we taught, I taught massage over clothes. Even the basic physical therapy techniques Ruby taught had to change for the unique needs of the Pakistanis. Well, for instance, the steps are narrow and uh, they, uh, they uh, can't get their uh, crutches. It's not wide enough to get their crutches and change their balance to walk up with crutches. So they drag the crutches upstairs with them and crawl up the stairs. When they get ready to come downstairs, they throw the crutches downstairs and crawl down because, you see, the steps would not be any deeper than that, and you take somebody that's handicapped and they can't get their heel on or have to turn their foot and they're handicapped and they can't do that, why, uh, they can't do it. And so, we, just, we don't do it that way here. In the end, Ruby learned how they did do it, and she helped teach her students ways of making it easier. Very instructive and very interesting. I wouldn't have missed it for anything, really and truly. For the next two decades, after her return from West Pakistan, Ruby's busy retirement continued. This included active membership in the APTA, frequent speaking engagements, and also the Ruby Decker Award. The Ruby Decker Award was started in 1962 by one of my ex-students that I do not know who, uh, it was for, to last for 50 years. This individual put money in on interest somewhere. I've heard several stories. And, when, and that was to last for 50 years. And this was to honor the outstanding clinical physical therapist. This is somebody working with patients. Another honor Ruby received is perhaps even dearer to her. 63 years, six months, and 10 days after I left the Army, I got an honorable discharge. Since her days as a Reconstruction aide, Ruby Decker has remained reluctant to speak out of turn. I don't, I don't just shoot off my mouth every time somebody says something. But if they make the mistake of asking me what I think about it, they're going to get it. But nothing used to bore me when I was working, like somebody that hadn't worked for 15 years telling you how to do it. As promised, however, when asked, she offered her ideas about the changes in physical therapy during this century. Physical therapy has not changed, period. I'll tell you why. The biological specimen has been the same for at least 35 million years. And when you do joint movement, for example, the elbow, it's done exactly now like it was then. Physical educator, reconstruction aide, chicken farmer, physical therapist, teacher, cultural ambassador. At the age of 90 plus years, what lies ahead for Ruby Decker? What's ahead? Yeah, what's ahead? Oh, I haven't the foggiest idea, but whatever it is, I'm gonna beat him to the draw.